The initial title of the film was called Mastermind, and then it was changed to Ubermind, before they ultimately decided and settled with the name Megamind. A lot of the changes involved the first name being trademarked and the second name outright sounding weird. The entire premise of the film was based on what if Lex Luthor beat slash defeat Superman, which explains why the 1978 Superman film was such a huge inspiration for this film and all the references made in the film itself. Guillermo del Toro ended up on the project as a creative consultant three weeks before the production of the film ended, playing a huge part of the editing in the film and a lot of the narration styles. An example of this is in the opening of the film. He would continue to expand on this role for the next several films over the next few years. Sequence 1 of Act 1 initially starts with a narration of Megamind falling to his supposed death. This is the part that Del Toro switched up that I mentioned earlier. He then takes us to his beginnings, which is where his parents had to send Megamind to Earth at 8 days old, like Superman was sent to Earth. Speaking of Superman and his equivalent, Megamind's arch nemesis named Metro Man was delivered to Earth in the same way, as he landed on a wealthy family's property while Mega Man was raised in jail. The feud continued through childhood and adolescence as nurture caused one to grow good and the other to grow evil. All of this is a prime example of nurture overcoming nature with how children grow up and this continued into their adulthood. With the background over in Denmark, we get to sequence 2 and the real action, where Mega Mind escapes prison. Roxanne, the news reporter, is kidnapped while her assistant Hal talks to himself incessantly about his crush on her. Roxanne is completely unfazed by all of this, since Mega Man has kidnapped her time and time again, while Metro Man beats him time and time again. I have to say that it's pretty funny seeing the damsel in distress not be distressed whatsoever and blatantly laughing at the villain's predictability. Metro Man is having a museum dedicated to him before Mega Man crashes the party and tells him about his plan before Roxanne blurts out that the location of the observatory to Metro Man. Mega Man did something unpredictable and caused everyone to think he was in the observatory while he was elsewhere to trap Metro Man. Long story short, Metro Man ends up dying which shocks absolutely everyone, including Mega Mind. Act 2 comes into fruition with Mega Mind walking into City Hall as everyone is fearful of him. It's not like he killed the mayor, unless Metro Man was the mayor, which was not cleared up or explained whatsoever. Anyways, Mega Mind soon gets bored, melancholy, and unhappy with power, since it's about the journey and not the destination. Hal continues to push onto Roxanne so he can make a move on her, but she rejects because she's not in the mood to do much celebrating or interacting with much people, still mourning. We get to see his anger, which will become important later on in the film, as he beats up on his van, which she does see but thinks nothing of it. Both her and Megamind end up mourning Metro Man for their own separate reasons and in their separate ways. As they talk, Megamind is disguised as Bernard. He realizes that he needs to create a hero with Metro Man's DNA, which ends the third sequence. Sequence 4 starts with Roxanne ending up at Mega Mind's observatory, so he has to disguise himself as Bernard as she expects Bernard to help her eavesdrop. She grabs the serum that will turn someone into a hero, and after turning back into Mega Mind to take it, they end up shooting it as they fight. She's fighting Mega Mind and accidentally lands onto her assistant Hal, who becomes the new Metro Man and is the midpoint of the film. Instead of defusing Hal, Mega Mind and his sidekick decide to use him as the new Metro Man and disguise themselves to train him to be Metro Man, which Hal agrees to since Metro Man was allegedly in a relationship with Roxanne. This leads to a mantra scene known as Sequence 5 as he is balancing training Hal and dating Roxanne under two different disguises. With the town being safe and everyone in the film being happy, things are of course going to take a sour turn at sequence 6, which is where all of Mega Mind's lies come out. He splits from his sidekick who is sick of the disguises, Roxanne is turned off by him pretending to be Bernard, and Hal wants to be evil. 
Act 3 starts with Megamind going to Hal's apartment, who turned evil after his deluded entitlement of thinking that he deserves Roxanne backfired, and reveals that he was Hal's space father who trained him, and the nerd who was kissing Roxanne. This finally causes his Hal to go after him, instead of wanting to team up with Megamind for being evil. Megamind starts to worry when Hal wants to kill him, instead of simply sending him to jail, like Metro Man did several times in the past. Megamind goes to Roxanne's apartment to ask her for assistance as to how to defeat Hal since she knew him so well, and she thinks the best idea is to go to Metro Man's complex. Roxanne wants an apology for being lied to, but nothing comes of it yet. Secret 7 comes to a finish when it's revealed that Metro Man is still alive. Metro Man gives us some backstory of his versions of events in Act 1, where he was tired of going through the motions with Megamind and decided to go on a walk with Chiyu's to his fast speed. Apparently he had some epiphany about being told what to do and not having a choice which is what he wants compared to everyone else who just naturally has choice. Since you can't just retire being a superhero, apparently you have to fake your death, which is exactly what he did. The point of all of this is for Metro Man to convince Mega Mind to be the new superhero. Mega Man gives up by going to jail, and a sidekick ends up breaking him out to stop Hal. Roxanne tries to reason with Hal, but it doesn't work, and now she's actually in distress. Since we all know Hal ends up being defeated, no time to waste to go into detail about it. Where all they do is use his dim weddedness and presumption of strength against him. I feel like the ending was a missed opportunity that I'll get into a bit later. And like many other GMAX films, we end the film off with everyone being so happy enough to the point where it leads to the arbitrary dance sequence. What do I like about this film? I actually like a lot about this film. The animation is very perplexing. While the designs are cartoony and not my favorite, it works for the theme and setting they're going with. A lot of the special effects with the machines, serums, and superpowers were cool to watch, and there's such a huge scope for it. Not the most memorable animation, but very colorful, elegant, and fitting. One thing I do have to call out is that Roxanne and Susan should not look exactly alike, Dreamworks. They could have done a lot better at that. I really like all the characters in the film. All of them but Hal, but I'm supposed to hate Hal and think he's a dweeb, so who cares? They gave both Mega Man, Mega Mind, and Metro Man flaws that are relatable and add dimension to them, but not make them unlikable. So we see both sides to them in regards to their feud and their roles. To see the organic flip from villain to hero and the hero to nothing was great and it was organic as well, which is a problem with a lot of these spoof films. Also, seeing a damsel in distress have a decent amount of character and not actually be in distress for most of the film was amazing to watch and we were seeing that she was more interested in this way superheroes function too compared to the actual superhero and villain. There is not a lot of characters in the film and it works perfectly since he focused on all of them appropriately and none of them feel useless or filler. While they may not get the same amount of screen time, they get the perfect amount of development and focus. The characters are tied to the major themes and plot lines, which were all handled well. Seeing the villains want to become heroes and the heroes becoming villains are nothing new, and was especially popular in this current decade of pop culture. And yes, you will eventually get there. There was nothing new about how they did the themes of nature versus nurture, having the ability and want for choice, subverting superhero tropes, etc. But they did it really well. As you can tell from the length of this video, and from what I've already commented on, I really like this film. I really do. But there's just one big flaw that not even I can ignore. Because they set everything so well up in the first two acts, and everything seemed to generally become more subversive, the third act is disappointing to say the least. It would have been cool to have a bit more of Metro Man, since for such an important character, he's barely in the film. And while Mega Man's arc, Mega Mind's arc is great, it was the contrast to the others that made it especially stand out. And Roxanne goes from the confident damsel in distress, who didn't feel like a damsel in distress, to being a legit damsel in distress. 
There's a huge emphasis on how neither Mega Mind or Mega Metro Man never had a choice in regards to where their lives would end up and what roles they would play. But the woman who's more interested in these roles than either of the men just ends up being a legit damsel in distress. It's how they end it. That's how they end it. Really? Ultimately, they took the really predictable route with the third act, and it would be one thing if it benefited from it, but the film really didn't. I'm going to outright say this, and while I am a bigger fan of this film, a much bigger fan of this film, I feel like it is one of the main reasons why the mass audience and animation fandom overall prefer Despicable Me to Mega Mind, because it was comfortable with what it was, and while most of the film is predictable, Gru was still confident enough in his villainous ways and submerged the both of them pretty well. It handled the balance a lot at the end, while Mickey Mind did well at it for the first two acts and just completely fell flat in the third act. When the film was released on November 5th, 2010, it opened very well for the first few weeks, but it was soon overshadowed by Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 and Tangled. Mega Mind ended up making $148 million domestically and $173 million in other territories, with a worldwide amount of a bit under $322 million worldwide. While the film was a moderate success, it was a disappointment for DreamWorks Animation, as it was one of their lesser performing films. Kensenberg and company decided to blame the disappointment of the film on the fact that it was a parody, like Shark Tale and Monsters vs. Aliens which both disappointed. It is why none of those films received sequels. In regards to the audience and critical reception, it received positive commentary about the voice, cast, and visuals, but it was not praised either. A lot of people commented on the fact that it seemed like it was copying from other movies from DreamWorks, but the biggest comparisons were to The Incredibles and Despicable Me, the latter being released a few months earlier. The minute response led to only a few nominations for Mega Mind, as it was overshadowed by several other films like Toy Story 3, Tangled, and Dreamworks' very own How to Train Your Dragon. I do feel like some of the Despicable Me comparisons are ridiculous, since they were in production at the same time. It just seemed like people wanted to compare it to one another, since the former was released a few months earlier in the summer. In conclusion, it seems like even with Dreamworks' better films, their prior reputation will continue to haunt them. The marketing for this film turned a lot of people off, resulting in the lower box office results, and the middling positive reception didn't do much to bring people in, which is a shame. I get why this film underperformed in comparison to the others. When you build an entire identity of a company around these pop culture-centric parodies, and the formula getting old before this film was even released, that stigma carries on, even if you slowly start to deviate from it. Despicable Me was a lot more approachable for families, seemed like it would be a more unique twist to it, and also seemed more fun with this refreshing British slash European touch to it. It is no wonder why that film became more successful, despite Mega Mind being a better film in my own opinion. I guess I get particularly sour now in hindsight, because Despicable Me has not only become the biggest animated franchise in the 2010s, but Beak, Shrek, and Toy Story with being the most successful animated animated franchise of all time, with no signs of stopping anytime soon. Compare this to Mega Mind, which has been lost in the shuffle, and a film that many people, including DreamWorks, overlooked without giving it a chance. I alluded to it a bit in the last review, but it needs to be fully addressed in this one, since the consistent releases affected Mega Mind more than the others. After having a spring release and a summer release, people were more than tired of DreamWorks in 2010, and as a response for the oversaturation, people simply didn't see Mega Mind. Compare this to Tangled, which was seen as a yearly event, especially after Disney started to revive themselves, and Toy Story 3 which was a yearly event that many people supported and has been waiting for for over a decade. DreamWorks lost this luster because they thought that releasing a bunch of films a year would drive people to them but just split the audience between the three films. This issue would get even worse because the budgets continued to rise and the oversaturation caused the box office results of original films to decrease, which would come to a halt in two years time as of late 2010.